Now we will begin uh, the next session. It uh, kind of blends from what uh, uh, Jason spoke about the future of education. And now he did talk about the future of uh, manpower and the labor market. Uh, Gallup is uh, our gold sponsor. They are masters at uh, subjects related to the labor market and creativity. And uh, I would love to uh, invite uh, the executive director for the Middle East and North Africa division of, of Gallup, Ms. Faith Gaines, to talk about for the next 20 minutes, the future of learning is rooted in creativity. So quite a, a number of buzzwords they keep on repeating since the morning. And let's hear what Faith has got to say. Ma'am, please do turn on your camera, share your screen, unmute yourself, over to you. Please unmute. You're still on mute. Yeah. There we go. All right, technology. All right, superb. <laughs> Mama Mia. <laughs> <laughs> Eureka, thank you, Fad, for the introduction, and thank you for the Saudi Education Technology Summit for inviting Gallup to be part of an important conversation today about the future of education. Um, so the session today is focused on the future of learning is rooted in creativity, and as Fad mentioned, my name is Faith Gaines, and I'm the Executive Director for the Middle East and North Africa. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Gallup, uh, we've been around for about 80 years and we work with education providers to inspire academic success, to achieve great jobs and great lives. And we do that in three ways. The first is by providing world-class analytics. The second is through advice. And the third is through learning. And just to give you a quick example of what it looks like when we help education providers with analytics from a student experience perspective is we help them identify what are the right metrics that will impact the outcomes that matter most for students, whether that's retention, graduation, engagement, and then we help them measure and manage to create a great student experience at the end of that. Um, we also help with overall employee experience in terms of staff, faculty, the whole organization, as well as developing future leaders. And everything that we do is really grounded in research. We leverage research to um, ensure that we're providing the right advice that transforms the organizations that we're working with. And so for today, we thought it would be helpful to share some of our latest research around creativity and learning. Um, and we wanted to start with a study that we didn't do, but another organization did in 2018. And it revealed this really big disconnect when it comes to employers' perceptions about proficiency and competencies for students and students' perceptions about their own proficiency. And so the study looked at eight competencies. I'm choosing to focus on three today that I thought were most relevant for this conference. I'm starting with digital technology. And this one was a little bit surprising to see that uh, employers rated grads more highly. So 65% of employers rated grads as proficient in technology compared to 60% of students. And we expect this number to continue to grow, of course, as technology becomes commonplace in education all the way from primary, secondary to tertiary education as well. And then the biggest gap is the second one here when it comes to leadership. So employers rated grads, only 33% of employers agreed that grads were proficient in leadership compared to about 71% of students themselves, which is definitely a huge disconnect there. And then the last one, critical thinking and problem solving, which the World Economic Forum uh, named as one of the top 10 skills that are going to be important for workers coming into the workplace. You also see a, about a 20% difference here with about 56% of employers rating GADs as proficient compared to about 80% of students who consider themselves proficient. So I think when we look at this data, the next natural question is, why is the gap so big and what can we do to close that gap? And so we wanted to share three base research approaches to help close that gap, starting with looking at creativity. Second, we'll provide a recommendation or idea around how to bridge that leadership gap. And then lastly, we'll share some of our latest fan findings around demonstrating care, which helps to bridge the gap from a college perspective. So in terms of creativity, we did a large study last year with one of the largest technology providers in the world. And we really wanted to understand what the role of creativity was in connection with technology. And so I thought it would be helpful to start with a definition of creativity. 
And um, to summarize it here, it's about new ways of solving problems, approaching challenges, making connections between disparate ideas. And it's not really about following a formula, but it's about a process of discovery and inquiry. And what we found in that study is that there's definitely an overwhelming support for leveraging technology and increasing the use of creativity. So you see here about 87% of teachers and 77% of parents um, agree that creativity in the learning process may be more difficult, but there's a high payoff for students. And though, even though there is excitement about including more creativity, what we see in standard classrooms today is there's still a lot of memorization. And by that, I mean, you learn a concept or idea, you take a task and then you don't revisit that idea again. And when we look more broadly, what we see is both students and parents really desire more real world, world applicability. So you can see here that 59% of um, parents believe that working on projects that have real world applications are very important for their kids' future. 51% want them to come up with their own ideas. So really focus on that discovery and critical thinking. And then 49% want them to try different ways of doing things even if it might not work. And when we think about the use of technology and we see it across the board right now, um, technology is definitely widespread. And I think as a result of COVID-19, we've definitely seen higher adoptions of technology as people have moved either to blended learning where kids are at home part of the time and in school part of the time or fully online learning. But what we are seeing is that technology is primarily used to conduct traditional tasks that could be accomplished with other tools. And so you can see here that 41% of students, 41% um, of teachers, sorry, and 68% of students say that students often use technology to write papers simply, or maybe to record that they've done a project online. And just 13% of teachers and 25% of students report using technology to see or experience something they otherwise would not have. So I think what we're seeing is there's definitely more opportunities to leverage technology and really bridge it with creativity. And when that happens, that, that marriage of those two things, we see that teachers who practice creativity and learning and use technology are more likely to see positive outcomes for students. And so I'm gonna show you some of those outcomes here on the right. And what you're looking at in terms of this data is the percentage of teachers who say their students demonstrate each cognitive skill very often or often and the data in the white bubbles that you see is for teachers who have lower focus on creativity, regardless of the technology use. The bubbles in the gray are teachers who have higher focus on creativity and substantial technology use. And the green is teachers who have higher focus on creativity and transformative technology use. So to give you an, a practical example of what this looks like is a teacher who has a lower focus on creativity and, and um, really doesn't use a ton of technology if they wanted to have their students create a report, they would simply say, you know, go home, do some research, write a five to 10 page report and come in and present it in a month. Teachers with a higher focus on creativity would say, you have the autonomy to really pick the subject that you want to write about, let's say it's science, and create a PowerPoint or a video that comes and you share with the classroom what you learned. And then those in the green bubble with a higher focus on creativity would give the students the autonomy to pick the subject. They are encouraged them to shoot a video, video. And then they would also have them post that video online where they could see other student videos. They can interact and they can give feedback on what they're seeing from their classmates, critique it, and really help to um, enhance that critical thinking. And so you start to see the differences there between the white bubbles where you have lower focus on creativity and not a lot of technology use versus the magic of when you can use creativity and technology as well. So in terms of the competencies, you see those who use both creativity and transformative technology are better in terms of problem solving, critical thinking, they retain what they learn, they're able to make connections between different subjects, they have deep learning of subject matter, and they perform better on standardized tests. So continuing with that same line of thinking, we see that Creativity and transformation technology use also help with the soft skills. So um, when teachers use both creativity and transformational technology, we see that students report using their strengths more. They express what they've learned in more creative ways. They have higher self-confidence. They have higher ownership. So they have more responsibility for their own learning. They're more likely to take risks. And they also have increased curiosity. 
And so we definitely kind of encourage the use of both the uh, increased technology uh, and also marrying it with that uh, transformative use of technology and creativity and to really prepare students for the 21st century workplace and bridge that gap that we talked about at the beginning in terms of problem solving skills and critical thinking skills is to really use um, our curriculums and design them in a way where they're developing those vital cognitive skills that students are going to need to, to succeed. And so pivoting here, the second um, idea we wanted to share with you was this round around strengths, right? And this one is around trying to solve that gap we see in terms of leadership competency, where there was that 30 point difference. And so I want you to think back to your educational experience. I want you to think about the very best educator you've ever had. So think about the best educator. It could be a teacher, it could be administrator. And I want you to think about what words come to mind when you think about that teacher specifically. So you can put them in chat and um, in the chat on the platform, or you can just think about them on, online. But what we typically hear when we ask this question is the best teachers help people feel seen, help people feel seen, heard, appreciated. They help build confidence in their students and they help students understand what they're naturally great at and areas that they need to improve. But what we see today in terms of our education systems is we see that there's still kind of the conventional education on the left here, which focuses on fixing what's wrong with students. So the approach is to identify what needs to be improved, develop an improvement plan, and then prevent failure. So majority of the time is really focused on deficits, what the student's doing wrong. That's where we spend most of the time in parent-teacher conferences. And if you contrast that with strengths-based education, that really focuses on what's right with students. So it's identifying areas where students excel, helping them discover and develop their strengths, and the ultimate goal is to achieve a success. And when we're thinking about strengths-based education, it's not that we're ignoring weaknesses, it's just we're shifting the equation. So instead of spending a majority of our time focused on what's wrong with students, we're really starting to focus a majority of our time on what is right with students. And a strengths-based development really honors every student's potential. It honors that every student has talent. It focuses on what they're good at and it helps improve student outcomes. So we see better retention, better engagement, and also better life outcomes um, post-graduation for those who are in university. And so what strengths does is it really helps us answer three important um, questions. And I'm talking about this in the lens of students, but this is relevant for, we use this for organizations and corporations as well. About 24 million people have taken their strengths finder. And what it does is it helps us identify what do we do best? How can I use my talents to accomplish what's most important? And then what are the unique contributions that I can make based on my talent? How can I give back? How can I serve um, beyond maybe what I do day to day? And so I wanted us to do an exercise and I know we can't see each other, but to help us kind of understand strengths, I want you to just raise one of your hands, any one of your hands. If you talk to people in elevators, airplanes, stores, or wherever you go, raise your hand wherever you are, okay. And raise your hand if you almost always have a color-coded or otherwise organized closet. So raise your hand, this is me. If this doesn't apply to you, you're like, these people are crazy, but this is me. And uh, keep your hand raised if your closet is organized by length. So if you go from um, you know, short sleeve to longer sleeve, okay? What about raise your hand if you almost always write down a list of things to do on the weekend and you stick to it, right? Raise your hand, either hand. Okay, and then raise your hand if you almost always need to pick someone to race when you're driving. So you're really competitive and you pick someone to race while you're driving. And then the last one is raise your hand if you're by an elevator, you're more likely to keep pushing the button to remind the elevator that you're there, right? In the hopes that it comes down faster. So we all have instinctive ways of behind, uh, thank you, Bot, I see you raising your hand. So we all have instinctive ways of behaving. These are things that we just do naturally without even thinking a lot of times. It's just autopilot in the way that we show up. And we're all different and we contribute in different ways. There may be things that you raise your hand for that other people didn't raise their hand for. Um, but when you know your talent, you feel empowered to succeed by doing what you naturally do best every single day. And when we think about talent, everyone has talent. And it's a naturally recurring pattern of thought, feeling, or behavior that can be productively applied. 
So some of the things that we talked about, for example, the person that talks to people in energy from starting a conversation with someone that they haven't met. And a student, it might look in a classroom like the kid who brings everybody together, who's always trying to connect people. As an adult, it might look like someone who networks really well and helps you multiply um, the communities that you serve within your organization. Thinking in an orderly manner, right? The people that create checklists uh, might be really great at operations and they get energy from organizing things and then helping us figure it out. And also thinking about people who consistently aspire to be the best, people who are driven by competition, who um, want to make sure that they are the best, that the people that they work with are the best. And um, also they're always kind of pushing us forward is also a talent. And everyone has talent. And as you invest in that talent, it becomes a strength, which is the ability to deliver consistent, nearly perfect performance in any task. So imagine a world where every student had the opportunity to understand their strengths or imagine a world where every one of your employees or your team members had an opportunity to understand what was unique about them. And so we do have a proprietary research-based tool that we use to measure these talents. And essentially it lets people know um, what are their top talents and what are kind of their lesser talents where they might need support. And the beautiful thing about it is the odds of somebody having the same top five as you in the same order is one in 33 million. So there's one in 33 million chance that somebody would have the same talents as you. So there's many different ways to lead. And I think whether you're an educator, whether you're a leader, um, you know, an executive in a corporate company, there's ways that you can help your teams understand who they are as leaders. So help them gain that self-awareness, help them gain that self-appreciation about who they are, what makes them different, what makes them unique to help them lead more effectively. And so I wanted to share a quick case study about an organization that we worked with that was a school district that wanted to create a student-focused culture and increase trust and collaboration amongst the staff. And their end goal was really to better prepare students to graduate more ready for college and fulfill a career. So it was a school district that had both primary and secondary education. And so we started by helping them um, conducting a qualitative and quantitative audit to understand where they were today, what were the barriers to fulfilling that vision of being more student-centric and help them prioritize interventions. And then we put in a systematic data-driven way to hire future staff um, to make sure that they were bringing in staff that were more statistically likely to drive student outcomes. And then we help them create a strengths-based culture so every leader, every student, every administrator within that school district was able to take StrengthsFinder. They were able to get some coaching or training so they understood who they were as a leader and how they could lead more effectively. And you can see the impact of that here on the right, on the black side, where we had uh, staff engagement increase by 65%, which is incredible because engaged staff um, are able to better engage students, better serve the community, and that helps with other outcomes like increased graduation rates, as you can see here, that increased their graduation by 18%. And the leadership was really excited because it um, helped them really further realize their vision. So the key takeaways here are really to learn your own unique strengths first. They make it possible for you to move to higher levels of excellence and fulfill your potential. They give you additional insight and help you lead more effectively. And then learn the strengths of those you serve, whether it's your students, whether it's your staff, whether it's your teams. I think the more that you're able to help them learn those, the more you can give them more intentional feedback about how they can develop. Um, and then lastly, is really change the equation and focus more time on what is right with people than what is wrong with people. And I know we have a few minutes left here, so I wanted to get to this last section about demonstrating care. Um, and we did a large study with graduates and undergraduates in universities, and we wanted to identify what are the six experiences that lead to a great college experience, but also a better life after college. And we found there are basically two buckets of experiences. The first is what we call support experiences, which are having a professor that cares, um, a professor that makes you excited about learning, and someone who encourages you to pursue your goals. And the second is experiential learning. So you have an opportunity to do an internship or job, work on a long-term project, or you're extremely active. And what we see is that student optimism rises with the more experiences they're able to have. So what you see in the dark green bars is the number of those six experiences that they have. And what you see in the light green bar going up is those who agree that they're confident that they have the skills needed for job market success. So you can see if they have six experiences, they're 76% more likely to say that they have job market success. 
And then we see those outcomes after they're on the job, right? So graduates who have those specific six experiences are 1.5, 1.4 times more likely to be thriving in five key areas of well-being. So they have greater financial well-being, they have better connections, they have better community, um, and they're thriving a lot more in their lives. And we also see that they're more likely to be engaged in their jobs if they had a mentor who cared about them. And so it's important to make sure that as um, organizations are really encouraging faculty to care and build supportive relationships with students. And we also see the same uh, connection correlation also in corporate workplaces as well. When you have a manager who cares about you, it definitely transforms you both in the workplace and outside of the workplace. I'll pause there, Claude. That is our, our, our session. And, uh, you know, if there's any specific questions, I don't know if we're at time. If we have time, happy to take I'll, them here. I'll, I'll take one. I'll on take chat. one because we'll we, have, we have a panel discussion next. Uh, but yeah, and also after the panel, there's a break. But but let me take the, this question. Uh, okay. I guess you've answered it, but I'm going to take it anyways. How does Gallup work with students to raise the bar in their creative uh, uh, in creative thinking across their life journey, especially when it comes to them preparing them for the labor market? Yeah, absolutely. We do it in a lot of ways. Um, I'll post some articles in the chat um, or on our page for those who want to see because we have specific case studies that we can share. But And overall, as we help students understand um, who they are and what they're naturally good at, uh, we help those in their community, whether it be their parents, whether it be um, educators, whether it be mentors, help guide them and have informative career development conversations about what that potential future could look like. And then we have lots of different training starting from university all the way to when they're in the workplace to help them develop the competencies that are most demand with employers. Okay, and there's one more here. With constant change in technology, how are we expecting our students and uh, parents to support, and, and especially the parents to support their child's learning uh, uh, effectively? This has def definitely got to do something with the uh, distance learning uh, context, since that is uh, the way forward and the new normal. And give me the question one more time. Uh, let me repeat that again. With constant change in technology, how are we expecting our students and especially parents to support the child's learning effectively? Yeah, it's an iterative process, right? And it really depends on the parent and it depends on the student and what their specific needs are. I think we're starting to see more evidence, more research-based evidence about the benefits of transformative technology and creativity like we were talking about earlier in this session here. Um, that educators can use as a foundation for a conversation about why there may be opportunities to integrate the right type of technology to support students. And then I think from there, it's just understanding where are your students in terms of technology adoption and where are they in terms of the skill sets that they have today? What are the specific gaps that may exist? And then what are the roles that each stakeholder plays in helping to get people up to speed? So what's the role of the parent? What's the role of the school system, the role of the teacher? local community and helping to bridge that gap. All right, great, superb. I can see uh, the next uh, panel entering and I would like to remind all, all of the attendees uh, to do visit uh, the Gallup uh, booth, interact with Faith and her team. Faith is, uh, is available on the platform. Please do uh, uh, network with her. She is indeed a very knowledgeable uh, uh, person out of here in, in the conference. She will be available on the platform. Uh, the platform is live until the 16th of, of uh, the month. And please do interact with her and do visit uh, the Gallup uh, booth. Uh, Gallup is our gold sponsor. So it's, it is indeed a privilege to having you with us, uh, Faith. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a fa fantastic presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.